Welcome, everybody, to episode 23 of the Serial Chillers podcast. I am your host, Jesse. Here with me, as always, my co-host and buddy, producer Greg. hey Hey, just even, even over the theme song. Check it out. Oh, dang. There you go. Oh, yeah, I could There's double two up. Two songs at once. Yeah. Two songs at the same time. So, <laughs> uh, Greg and I have been racking our brain a little bit on how we can make the show great and keep it coming week after week while still being able to put together something that we have, you know, become accustomed to putting together. Um, it's it's grown very apparent that having a game show each week may not be plausible, but we're shooting for it still. That's always the goal. But today we're going to bring you a little example of what we can do when we don't have a game show. Um, kind of bring in a little bit of a collection of stories. I don't want to burn up all the cool serial killer stories just between Greg and I. I definitely want to use them for the game show purposes. So since we couldn't get a game show going this week and this episode is coming to you guys late, Greg and I just wanted to bring you kind of a little collection of stories that we put together. So you guys just Gotta let us know what you think about this. Love the feedback on everything. Um, iTunes users, don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. You guys have been doing that. I see the feedback. We are taking things from that. I saw the uh, the review about audio quality. We're working on it. We're trying to get the show louder. We're trying to get it more clear. We're trying to get guests in studio. We're getting them to speak into the mic. We, we understand. We hear. We are actively trying to fix these things. So thank you for the reviews. Um, Essentially, just hope the direction you guys... I hope you guys like the direction we're headed, Greg. Uh, how do you like it? <laughs> Who, me? <laughs> um, the only Greg no, I know. I, <laughs> I, I enjoy it. I like yeah. the show. I like the game show idea, but I also know that it takes a lot to make a game show happen every week. Like, I don't know how The Price is Right does it daily. <laughs> we just gotta but, get, We just got to get on that level. Yeah, see? Donate to the Patreon. Yep. And do you guys think you think Bob will price is right level? I'm down to step down if Bob will come host. Is he alive still? He is, dude. He is. Believe that. Anyway, um, thank you. Speaking of Patreon supporters, thank you to Megan and Laura. Uh, I have their last names here. I don't think that's the best idea to read them. So if you guys want me to send me a message and I'll say your, your last name on the next one. But thank you to Megan and Laura for being new Patreon supporters. Greatly appreciate it. Thank always, you. yeah, thank you. It's always cool to see a month where there are new Patreon supporters on there. Always cool to see when it's not like our friends and family. So, a little round of applause for the uh, Patreon supporters. Thank you guys. Yeah, Patreon supporters are the best. Woo. Um, no, seriously, it, it's a huge deal to me. Anybody who would give me a dollar a month, even, is a uh, is a uh, okay by me. So, thank you guys for the support. Um. I've got a fairly recent story for you. I've got a unsolved missing persons case for you. And I've got kind of just a fun, kooky one. Uh, Greg, if you guys don't know, is an expert in fun, kooky shit. So he'll give us his breakdown of this at the end. That's going to be the last thing we talk about today. So um, any other uh, orders of business you can think about before we get started today? I just want to give a quick shout out to the Central Intelligence Agency. Uh, <laughs> as of right now, we are like T minus four days from getting all the JFK stuff. That they're just they're just no, nothing but redacted papers. Well, that's kind of, or, or it's going to be all none of it's going to be redacted. And they're just going to be like nothing out of the ordinary happened. The Warren Commission found that Jack Ruby acted alone as well as Lee Harvey Oswald, and there was no greater conspiracy. You know what I mean? Yep. Coming anyway. this spring, Greg's oh. Conspiracy Podcast. Oh, God. <laughs> well, if we don't have anything other updates or conspiracy, everybody please sit back, relax, and enjoy this episode of the Serial Chillers Podcast. I don't have a song or anything for you guys today. Oh, so okay. what are we <laughs> doing here today? We are talking about... So this one was kind of a, a big one for me. I think you and I may have been living together when this happened. So... Um, A lot of this information I got for this article in particular comes from uh, tblakebratty.com, Nashville's true crime and horror mystery author. Uh, The article is called Titanfall, the horrific story of NFL star Steve McNair's death. 
I do remember when this happened. I'm pretty sure we were living together. If not, we were hanging out when you found out. Because I remember you were super bummed for a few days. He was definitely my favorite football player. So let's jump right into it. We'll kind of talk about that a little bit. We're going to Tarantino this bitch. On July 4th, 2009, at 1.35 p.m., a man named Rupert Gaddy called 911 and reported finding two bodies in a residence at 105 Leah Avenue near downtown Nashville, Tennessee. A 300-pound-plus lineman from the Nashville Cats arena football team, Gaddy was known around the town as Big Daddy Gaddy. Uh, Appropriate. <laughs> he was known... Uh, as well for being Steve McNair's like right hand man, they were gr- good buddies. They were hardly seen without one another. Um, kind of talk a little bit about Steve McNair here. He was a, a quarterback uh, in the NFL. He was kind of known for his toughness. The guy played 13 seasons, and um, he there was one point where he was playing with like four broken bones and like this deep tissue bruise, and he was just out there every week. So it's kind of a Kind of that Iron Man that was always out there, and he was like one of the great scrambling quarterbacks of the of like the late '90s and early 2000s, or all time maybe. Got any Air McNair memories, Greg? Um, I'm gonna be honest. I was a more sedentary child, so I don't remember so much <laughs> about sports. I didn't. I don't. I don't. I don't get active. Right. Much, so right. understood. Understood. Um, I do, however, remember. Um, being paid to pull numbers for my dad's fantasy football team. Like he, his friends would all come over. And I remember one of them had Steve McNair and I remember bringing back a lot of good news. Yeah. Steve so, McNair was the dude. So he, he was, was he was a great quarterback. He's from Mount Olive, Mississippi. He went to college at Alcorn state university is in Lorman, Mississippi and won the Walter Payton award, which is essentially the Heisman for D two schools. Uh, if you don't know what the Heisman is, it's like the, MVP for college football uh, athletics. If you don't know what MVP is, it's the most valuable player. It's the best player in the league by, as voted by some type of board. So uh, Steve McNair, given the Walter Payton Award, best D2 football player there was. Um, pretty, I mean, pretty well accomplished for somebody who was said to have been born in a tin roof shack in the, in the like, essentially the mountains of Mississippi. So. Mm-hmm. Um, he was selected third overall in the NFL draft by the Houston Oilers and enjoyed a storied 13-year career in the NFL. Uh, he only played for two teams, and he just played for the Ravens in the last, I think, two years that he played. Um, yeah, those were the, the uh, hanging on years. Right. So if this were a sports podcast, as you know, Greg, and as some of you out there listening may know, uh, big sports fan. Um and I could probably go all day just on Steve McNair, but I know that everybody out there is already thinking, shut the fuck up and tell us true crime. So that is what I will do. Uh, it is a true crime podcast. So sports aside, um, the first officer shows up after Big Daddy Yaddy's call. Just four minutes later, he happened to be in the area. It's 1.39 p.m. And he finds uh, that one of the victims was the former football star, Steve McNair. The other appeared to be a woman whose dead body lay at his feet on the floor in the living room. The man turned out indeed to be Steve McNair. Uh, and the woman was his girlfriend, Sahel Kazemi. She went by Jenny. Um, I would too. We're going to step back in time a little bit to Thursday, July 2nd, 2009, two days before Steve McNair's death. Kazemi is pulled over for a DUI in Nashville while driving a Cadillac Escalade registered to both McNair and Kazemi. Now, I should clear up that Steve McNair at this time is a married man. Um, it's It seems from what I can gather that his wife was aware of the relationship. And an open relationship is not, um, <coughs> to me at least, it doesn't mean that these are bad people. He was an NFL star. That doesn't mean he lived by different rules. But it seemed that his wife was, you know, it was cool with him kind of hanging out with the... I've heard stories of... Uh, athletes having um, got road wives and road girlfriends right. and stuff like that. When you're away from home for an extended period of time, like if you live here, but you but you play for this team here, like you have your family that you come home to and everything. But you're allowed you're allowed to be a little extracurricular. Hey, that's not the lifestyle that we live, but it is um, something that may be out there. So besides the point, again. Um, they're together a lot. They have a vehicle. This Escalade is registered to both Steve McNair and Sahel Kazemi. 
Uh, McNair is in the car uh, as well as Vent Gordon, the chef at one of Steve McNair's restaurants that he owns. Uh, McNair refuses to get out and talk to the police, even though Sahelka Zamy essentially asks, hey, come on, you're Steve McNair. We're in Nashville, Tennessee. I need you to get me off right now. Like, the, all you have to do is come in and say three words, and I'm not going to get arrested. And I'm Steve McNair. Right. And Steve <laughs> McNair said nah and called a taxi in and got out of there so kind of an interesting situation she gets arrested for the dui um Ooh, bummer weird irony in all of it is that the officer who arrests kazami for the dui is the same one who six years earlier arrested steve mcnair for the exact same charge so same Maybe that's ar- why he didn't want to get out that is probably wouldn't probably have probably situation. recognize that dude hey this guy knows i got a dewey uh, later that night, Sahel Kazemi purchases a 9 millimeter from a convicted murderer she met while trying to find a buyer for her Kia. So, I should mention, in the meantime, Steve McNair did bail her out. Okay. He didn't want to be a part of trying to use his name or the media circus that might be involved around. Steve McNair is trying to say, look, I'm Steve McNair. Get, you know, let her go. Um, he didn't want to use his name or clout to get her out. He knew that he could go down post the bail she'll have a dui but he'll take care of her so um she later that night like we said uh we, we're into july 3rd now because they've they've crossed over the midnight barrier uh she buys the pistol um there's also speculation that she was with her ex-boyfriend keith norfleet in the hours before being bailed out of jail for a dui so keith norfleet was a uh, possibly visiting just to check on her. So we're going to go a little kind of minute by minute here on July 3rd at 10.05 a.m. Because Amy texts Steve McNair, baby, I might have a breakdown. I'm so stressed, end quote. She also states that she needs to pay, quote, the cell phone bills in the hospital, end quote. At 4 p.m., McNair tells Kazemi that $2,000 is being transferred to her account. This is pretty common practice for them it's kind of how it works he takes care of her financially he's an nfl star he was a very well-paid man he did not have any uh any he didn't uh, want for much right he was also uh very smart with business i i understand he had a few restaurants he had some investments he had a couple other small businesses that were making money for him as well so he was in the in the money making business it seemed like that steve mcnair he was out there kind of doing the damn thing and uh taking care of himself after after NFL retirement. So did you hear that about his um, air purifier business? I did not. Oh yeah, he had an air purifier business called Clean Air McNair. Thank oh you. my god. Thank you. Um so uh, at 4 p.m. he again he tells her that there's $2000 being transferred to her account. He later texts that or sorry, she later texts that quote she can hardly breathe and quote I just want the pain in my chest to go away, end quote. Now, I know you you maybe a little bit, and I know myself a lot of it. This sounds like she's having an anxiety attack and isn't sure what's happening. Does it not? Like, so this, this yeah. weight on and her chest. It sounds this... like she had, like, the uh, uh, a freak out. Yeah, yeah. She's kind of um, experiencing something that she hasn't before. Um, the pain in my chest, I can hardly breathe. It sounds like a good old-fashioned anxiety attack. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm not a doctor. I could or, be completely wrong. Or a gunshot wound to the chest, I mean. Yeah, yeah, we're not quite there yet. Um, At 4.04 p.m., because Amy texts McNair, quote, Baby, I have to be with you tonight. I don't care where, end quote. At 8.34 p.m., because Amy again texts McNair, quote, Baby, where are you going to be at when I get off? End quote. At 11 p.m., McNair finally texts her back after he's put his children to bed. On Saturday, on Saturday, July 4th, 2009, at 12.38 a.m., McNair texts his Amy, I'm on my way. Presumably, this is to the condo where the two of them met up. At 1.14 a.m., Kazemi tells McNair that the door is open. At 2.23 a.m., there is one more text sent to McNair's phone that says, quote, I'm going to the store. It was sent approximately 23 minutes after the Metro Nashville Police Department believes Kazemi killed Steve McNair and then herself. Um, according to Sammy Saltman in a 2009 article, quote, 
T-Mobile subpoena compliance specialist Melanie Caldwell told Nashville authorities that it is possible this message, which was received by McNair's BlackBerry at the time, was delayed in transit and was actually sent earlier, end quote. So he's got this text <laughs> message from her half an hour after they were supposed to both be dead saying, hey, I'm, I'm heading to the store. So it kind of called in. It's just a weird hitch in the story that didn't make a lot of sense to anybody. So um, the timeline doesn't doesn't add up right so this t-mobile subpoena compliance specialist melanie caldwell is telling us otherwise that you know it it essentially can just get caught out in the ether and his phone pulled it in when it had the the right service to do that so um, once they'd arrived at the scenes officers found two bullets in the walls almost immediately and one was attributed to mcnair the other to his girlfriend the nine millimeter used in the murder suicide was then found underneath kazami's head during the investigation McNair had a gunshot wound with contact wounds to his right temple and an exit gunshot wound through his right temple. Uh, McNair Wait. also... I'll tell you why. Uh, it's just going side by side. He's got an entrance and an exit on the right. McNair also has gunshot wounds non-contact to his left temple and an exit to his left temple. So he was shot one side, Twice. the other. Yeah, boom, boom. Boom on the right. Switch over to the left. Boom again. Because um, Amy or, had... Or two guns same time yep two shooters uh boondock saints um Mm -hmm. so kazami had a contact gunshot wound to the right side of her head and an exit wound on the left side due to lack of any defensive wounds or defensive posturing from mcnair police believe steve mcnair was asleep on his couch on the couch when he was shot and killed early in the hours of july 4th 2009 according to the case summary mcnair's blood alcohol level was point one five percent nearly twice the legal limit at the time now it twice the legal limit to drive he wasn't driving but just to give you right just to give you an example he's literally double what they allow you to drive with so that is a point one five is a is a high blood alcohol content so that's 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 pretty drunk yeah that's pretty drunk doesn't that mean that uh let's see what's a point one five that's something like but how's how's never mind that's dumb the math's gonna break down stupid and i'm just gonna make myself sound more stupid than i actually am but i am pretty (laughs) dumb so um the police believe essentially this quote the totality of the evidence leads to the conclusion that kazami shot mcnair in the left side of his head shot him twice in the chest and then put the gun to the right side of his head and shot him again which is where he got the contact wound It is concluded that Kazemi sat on the sofa to McNair's left in such a way that she would fall into McNair's lap upon committing suicide by shooting herself in the head. The bloodstains show that Kazemi's upper body was in McNair's lap before she slid down his leg and onto the floor. A few key points lead up to McNair's death. Um, We're going to talk about a couple extenuating circumstances here on July 1st. An African-American male who is not Steve McNair or Adrian Gilliam, who is the man who sold uh, Kazemi the gun showed up at the Opry Mills, Dave and Buster, where Sahel Kazemi worked and hung out and eating without eating or drinking. <coughs> this guy was chilling for like, uh, I think it was like an hour. Uh, yep. She spent an hour talking to him on her shift and then disappeared for two hours during her 30 minute break. And she was sent home after that, essentially because she had disappeared. Although the Thursday before his death, July 2nd, McNair was out with Kazemi and chef Vint Gordon. And that's the DUI we talked about before. Um, According to the taxi driver that night, um, McNair went to Loser's Bar in Midtown Nashville for 15 or 20 minutes, had himself one or two drinks before requesting to be taken back to the residence on Leah after he got Kazemi out of, of jail. So he goes. So she and, went down for DUI, and he went to the bar. Well, he he them. goes first to bail her out, and then knows that the process is going to take some time. So he takes her or goes down, gets the bail process rolling, gets takes a taxi over gets a couple drinks and then goes to the condo to wait for her. So later that evening, Kazemi having been bailed out by McNair ventures to meet convicted murderer, Adrian Gilliam, who we talked about before as well. So it's a nine millimeter semi-automatic pistol. According to an article in ESPN, there are some signs that she was not quite herself in the hours leading up to her death. Cause there's kind of this big thing. Like some people were saying, well, she was acting normal. She's fine. There's no psychotic break. She was a jealous girlfriend. And this is just, you know what, this was the ends to the means. This is what she was always going to do. Um, some people say she she definitely wasn't. So there's this ESPN article that says um, a shift manager at Dave and Buster's who worked with Kazemi on the night of her on the last night of her life told police that Kazemi was normally upbeat, 
but in the hours before the murder, something was different. She rolled her eyes when asked about McNair's promise to divorce his wife, Michelle. Oh, his wife, Michelle. Kazemi, according to a police statement, told her manager, quote, my life is just shit and I should end it, end quote. Um, That's heavy. Yeah. So, I mean, this is the night that she purportedly ends it. So um, after and during the time she's at work, she calls a handful of friends during the day to make 4th of July plans um, that wouldn't be kept. She tried to sell some furniture on Craigslist this day. She goes to work and clocks out early, texts McNair that she had to be with him. We know we talked about that. One of her final calls was to Lucretia Polite, a friend who she had planned on going out with that night. Polite said that she was in Memphis and she was not going to be able to go out. Kazemi, um, Polite says, told her that's okay and she'd call Steve to see what he was doing. Um, This little uh, excerpt came right from the T. Blake Brady uh, blog and it said, It is extremely possible to come to the conclusion that Steve McNair and Sahel Jenny Kazemi would still be alive today had she only been able to go out with someone else, anyone else, that Friday night, July 4th. He thinks that if, well, her, if every one of her plans hadn't fallen through, then, you know, we might be looking at a different situation. But, you know, the, well, the I think mixture of her the same situation just a couple days later. Maybe so. Maybe so. I mean, but if, if, it, that's, if that's the only thing that, that kept it from happening. Right. It seems like uh, it was just one really bad day. There's a little bit of anxiety, maybe a shitty day at work. Took off a little early because you got in some trouble. You can't make any plans with the friends you thought were going to be around for 4th of July. Your boyfriend's kind of, you know, she texted him many times during the day and he texted back like twice. And he didn't well, come over and, until midnight. And, you know, he's a little wasted but, when he got there. And But she still bought a gun from a dude. Like, she knew what she was up to. Right. There are... Um, a couple also, how things. did how do we know the how do we know that she bought the gun from this guy? Did, like, they... They traced the gun and it came back to him and he was like, oh yeah, that was mine. I sold it to that bitch. Yeah. Wow. So we'll talk about that. Uh, later testing concluded that Kazemi was the sole shooter. There was powder residue on Kazemi's left hand indicating that she had fired using both hands. So it was more on her left hand leading with her left hand. She had used both hands in almost all of the uh, firing. Uh, there were n- there were no uh, there was no GSR at all on either of Steve McNair's hands. Uh, although the official investigation into Steve McNair's death seems pretty conclusive, a few lingering questions remain. Uh, former police officer Vincent Hill believes Kazemi did not, in fact, murder McNair and turn the pistol on herself. His main evidence comes from the fact that McNair, who very often carried thousands of dollars rolled up in a rubber band, and was found to only have six dollars in his wallet when his body was found. A more minor but nevertheless credible point relates to Adrian Gillian, the gun seller's uneven testimony. Gilliam claims that he avoided the truth in his initial interviews because his fiance was present. He didn't want her to know that he about his uh, intentions with Sahel Kazemi. So Sahel Kazemi was, uh, you know, getting around. Let's she say. sounds like a floozy. Yeah, so, and uh, Gilliam wanted a piece of that too, so he was, you know, thinking, I'll sell her the gun, I'll, you know, make a couple moves, and things will be nice, because I'm Adrian Gilliam. Um, yeah, he, he's a liar, so we can't really cast uh, aspirations on Gilliam purely for his past, but it wouldn't surprise anybody if he had something to hide about the whole murder-suicide. This is another T. Blake Braddy quote, so uh, the last point Vincent Hill, the former police officer, brings up is that... C- <laughs> is that Kazemi purportedly hated guns. Her family has requested that the investigation be reopened, although the odds are not good that they do. That's pretty much it, man. Um, That's a sad story. Yeah, like... there there are a couple, you know, little quirks at the end that kind of, you know, make you think a little bit. Maybe not so much, but um, otherwise it is, yeah, it is just a sad kind of... Uh, true crime story and that's what all of them are it did involve somebody who was a little more famous so you know maybe a few more people heard of it and something that probably happens more often than we care to believe and you know we don't hear about it but since it did involve somebody big this time we were you know we were privy to all the information um yeah it just sort of seems like i said she had just a bad day in the worst kind of way and like you said to counter that she did buy a gun and there are a few different um 
outlets that say, you know, she didn't like guns, but she felt unsafe for certain reasons, so she bought a gun. And I know, you know... Because she's hanging out with convicted felons right. and buying guns from them. Right. Like, so, I mean, she can't she can't defend any of her actions. She's dead. Um, and you never... We'll, we'll never really know, because they're not reopening this case. Let's be real here. Unless some kind of crazy evidence comes forward that, you know... But I'm not even sure what would come forward other than somebody saying like, you know what? It wasn't her. It was me. Really, other than that, what are we what are we looking at here? It's two dead people that they can't tell a tale any longer. What do you think, man? I feel like there's got to be surveillance footage or something. You're I mean, it was just like a condo community. Um, If it was gated, like, let's check that. I'm sure they did all that. Yeah, it's. I mean, we're talking. We're eight years out now, so I think I think the investigation is done. Yeah. So re- done cold. really quickly, just want to source this one out because I like to do that. Uh, a lot of articles from CBS News. We had. Uh, I got an ar- article from the AutopsyFiles.org, Nashville Post, um, ESPN.com, uh, a YouTube video, and uh, TBlakeBrady.com. So. Uh, Thank you, everybody, for help with that. That was very appreciative. It, it, I, I remember that story very well. I remember our friend Mike called me and knew that it was going to be, like, a big deal to me. I was like, dude, you need to sit down. And I I mean, I, to be honest, initially I thought, like, a friend had died or something. And then when he told me it was Steve McNair, I was slightly relieved, but then also very bummed and wished that I had sat down. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, it, it, it was... You real you thought it was a friend and then realized it was almost like it was a friend. Right, that's almost exactly it. So we'll take a quick break right here. Uh, we'll come back with a couple more stories for you guys, and make sure you come back, or Greg will kill you. Yeah. You're listening to True Crime Story Time. We are Casey and Samantha, your hosts. We created this podcast to give ourselves an excuse for our terrifying Google history, to take a deeper look into true crime and find the message inside each case. Not all true crime cases consist only of murder, but they do all have lessons that we can take from them. Ways to protect ourselves, educate ourselves and raise awareness. And lessons on our rights as human beings. I'm Casey. I'm a criminology student, a teacher and a true bibliophile. I love to read, research, learn, and educate others if I can. And I'm Samantha. I'm just a true crime junkie. It's all I read, it's all I watch, and now with this podcast, it's honestly all I do. We're going to bring you old and new cases of murder, theft, abduction, assault, fraud, disappearances, conspiracy theories, and many more. And we hope you come along for the ride, because every story has a message. All right, welcome back, everybody. Episode 23 in full swing. I am your host, Jesse, as always, across the internet. Producer Greg. Hey, Greg, Yo, welcome back. You. Still here, not killing people. Thanks for sticking around. That's right. You stick around and you don't die. That's the story on the Serial Chillers podcast. What a wonderful thing, right? Also, the secret to life. Just listen to this and live forever. Dang, the Serial Chillers podcast, the fountain of youth since 2017. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so, Steve McNair, sad story. We can both agree on that. Uh, Affirmative. I don't have anything to cheer you up, but we'll move on to the next one and see if uh, this one, <laughs> this one I actually feel like it's the first time that, you know, I'm, I've, I've got a missing person story. Um, it is an old but active case. So I'm going to go through kind of the details here. And I literally took this right off the, um, I want to say it's called the Charlie project. It's this, uh, website for finding missing persons. So we'll, we'll get to the details at the end, but I've got a phone number. I've got a website. I've got a, you know, if you have any information on the case. So I feel like I'm being a little proactive here with this one. Uh, this one is the disappearance of Laureen Ann ran. The last name is R A H N. Could be Ron, Ran. I'm just gonna go with Ran, uh, for continuity's sake. 
uh, Laureen resided with her mother, Judith Rann, in a third-floor apartment on Merrimack Street in Manchester, New Hampshire. She was a student at Parkside Junior High School and made good grades. Judith's then-boyfriend was a professional tennis player, and he and Judith were out of town at a tennis tournament when Laureen disappeared on April 26, 1980. She normally accompanied them, but on that day she had asked to be allowed to stay home, and her mother agreed. So she's 14 now, and her, her mom's like, yeah, well, well, you could stay home. Like, what, you know, who the hell am I to just drag you with us every time we go out? And I do this with my professional tennis player boyfriend. So she was, it was probably more like, kind of tired of your shitty 14 year old <laughs> attitude. Why don't you just stay home? Right. And uh, to couple that, it was also spring break. So she, I think, I think it was more of a let her daughter stay, let her daughter kind of do the spring break teenage thing. Uh, The evening that they that they left, April twenty sixth, Laureen made, uh, or sorry, Laureen, a male friend and a female friend, spent some time drinking beer and wine in Laureen's apartment. The boy later stated he heard voices in the hallway and left through the back door because he thought Judith was coming home and he was afraid he would get in trouble. So he thought her mom was coming home and slid out through the back door. Uh, He heard Laureen lock the door behind him. When Judith arrived home at midnight, she noticed that the light bulbs in all the hallways on the third floor of the apartment building had been unscrewed and everything was dark. Weird. Yeah. So all the way down the hallway, every light bulb is unscrewed. When she gets to her own apartment front door, she realizes that the door is unlocked. Judith checks Laureen's room and sees um, her tucked into bed. In the morning, however, Judith discovers that it was not Laureen, but her girlfriend who had fallen asleep in the room. Laureen was gone. Her clothes and brand new sneakers were in the living room, and the back door was open. Her friend stated she had last seen her sleeping on the couch, and although police initially suspected Laureen was a runaway, Judith did not believe her daughter had left on her own because Laureen had left behind her clothes and purse. Within a few weeks, investigators reconsidered the runaway theory. Um, They stated it appeared as if Laureen had left the apartment willingly and intended to return within a short time. Judith discovered that she had been charged... Uh, for three California phone calls on October 1st, 1980, three months after Lorene disappeared. Judith did not have any friends or relatives in California at the time. Lorene had never lived there and had no ties to the area. Two of the calls had been placed from a motel in Santa Monica to another motel in Santa Ana. The third call was placed to a teen sexual assistance hotline. The physician who maintained the hotline at first denied knowing anything about it, but in 1985 changed his story. The doctor said that a numerous runaway girls occasionally visited his wife at their home, and one of the young women may have been from New Hampshire. The individual claimed that Annie Sprinkle, a woman who allegedly worked with his wife in the fashion industry, may have had information concerning several runaways. So this is like a... The best comparison I could think it's like a it's like an underground railroad for runaways. They've got this this place they can go, they can hide out, they can kind of be be safe uh, and away. Yeah, exactly. So be somewhere you won't be found. And you know, he, this doctor is even saying like I don't, I don't really you know, I don't really know shit about it. He didn't he didn't come forth with really in, information <coughs> until 5 years later and even then it was that yeah, one of them might have been from New Hampshire. That seems suspicious. It does seem suspicious. Maybe it wasn't a safe place. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, maybe it's like uh, Taken. Or like Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Well, I and I've got... <laughs> oh, that's a good one. Yeah, yeah. So, um... Watch that. Uh, authorities learned that Sprinkle was involved in the pornography industry, not the fashion industry. Um, after scanning several of her films and attempts to locate Laureen, uh, no evidence linking Sprinkle to Laureen's disappearance was ever discovered, and she has never been implicated in her case. So, What a job, man. Here, take these home, watch them. Here's who you're looking for. Exactly. I mean, every scene. Look at the background actors. Nope, not this one. Next. 
Um, an investigator visited California on Judith's behalf in 1986 and located the two motels involved in the October 1980 phone calls. Authorities said that one of the establishments may have been used by a child pornographer named, quote, Dr. Z. I had to make sure you know that those are in quotes because I'm not just fucking calling this motherfucker Dr. Z. Uh, investigators were unable to link, quote, Dr. Z to the teen hotline, and it is not known if pornography was involved in Lorene's disappearance. Roger Morais, Lorene's childhood friend in Manchester, received a call from a woman identifying herself as Lori or Lorene in 1986. Morai's mother answered the call and said that the person claimed to be her son's former girlfriend. The caller's identity to this day remains unknown. One of Lorene's family members reported seeing a girl matching her description in a Boston, Massachusetts bus terminal in 1981. That was only a year after the disappearance. For about a year after Lorene disappeared, her mother frequently got mysterious phone calls. They always came at approximately 3.45 a.m., and the caller would never say anything. Judith continued to receive phone calls around the Christmas holidays for several years from an unknown individual. She said that the person listened silently while Lorene's sister answered the phone, then terminated the call shortly after. The calls stopped after Judith changed her number several years after Lorene vanished. A witness reported that a prostitute in Anchorage, Alaska matched Lorene's description. The unconfirmed sighting occurred in 1988, and authorities said that the witness based his recollections on a 1980 photo. The woman was not to believe to have been Lorene as a result of the time lapse. Uh, the boy who was drinking alcohol with Lorene on the night of her disappearance committed suicide five years later in 1985. He was never considered a suspect in her case. Maybe just had a lot of guilt. Um, or, or he should have been considered a suspect. Perhaps. And... Perhaps. Um, I know I'm kind um, of flying I, through this, this is, thought so I, I far. Will, I know this isn't a conspiracy podcast, but maybe she got MK Ultra, man. They just snuck in. They took her. There's no excuse. There's no evidence. There's no direct sighting. There's just enough misinformation. Well, that's why I brought you on to get a different look on things. And I don't, I mean, from what I know, about MK Ultra from doing anxious extroverts with you is is that it's not if it does truly reach as far as it claims to it, it I guess it's not impossible but 1980 is very late is my only it's not all right so uh, 2017 is not very late Okay, so uh, anybody who's interested in anything conspiracy or MK Ultra, you guys can reach out to us on the Twitter. Greg mostly um, uh, resides there, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so just I, I, I was I'm just thinking that sounds like the same process. It sounds like the you know the instant disappearance and uh, weird circumstances like with the light bulbs being all unscrewed, and so you know, because because who wouldn't go through and bother to do that if they're kidnapping somebody? You know what I mean? Yeah, I I mean, um, it might be some killer who thinks that that is going to help in some way to, you know, I don't know, someone who's seen too many movies, somebody who's just got a, an issue or a problem or. Yeah, I just, I, the, the just stuff that makes me think. Right, I'm sorry. for sure. No, 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 you, don't be sorry. That's why you're here, man. That's why you're here. I love your kooky thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> so, um. Judith moves to Florida during the years after Lorraine's disappearance and eventually remarries. She believes that her daughter placed the three California phone calls in October of 1980. Um, Lorraine enjoyed singing and dancing at the time of her disappearance and dreamed of becoming an actress. Judith believes she is still alive and some of Lorraine's acquaintances may know more about her disappearance than they disclosed in 1980. I didn't really... I, 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 I wanted to take that line out because there's, there's no real anything after or before this i just i don't know you know what 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 does her mom think you know i, I want to know what her mom thinks i want to know i want to know what's going it's going on inside her head about okay this whole situation. well let me, let me put it to you this way she thinks mk ultra no 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 mm -hmm. well i don't know i don't know what she thinks but if if we're trying to like get to what's inside the mom's head right now think of put yourself in their shoes you're a parent so put yourself in in that mom's shoes. Your your child is gone. The evidence does not line up. 
you feel, of course, you're going to think that the people who saw her last or who were with her last are going to have more information, whether or not they do. You're going to hold those people almost personally responsible for what's going on because that's true. Because they were the last people who saw. Why didn't? Why don't you have more information? Why did you leave her alone? Well, because she's a friggin' adult almost. Right. So, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Like that. That's that's just my personal feeling. If you're trying to get inside the head of the mom, I think that's what the mom's thinking, and she's holding those kids responsible when it may or may not be their fault. I'm not one to say. But right. Right. And and they may or may not have more information to disclose. They may have more information to disclose that they don't even know that they, you know, you know what I'm saying? It's like those details yeah. that they didn't realize are important that maybe now, you know, 37 years later are, are long gone. Yeah. Well, one of them's something, dead. Something one of the two people that were mentioned. there was dead five years later. So, um, Investigators continue to sus- <laughs> investigators continue to suspect foul play was involved in her case, which does remain unsolved to this day. Denise Denault, a 25-year-old woman who lived just two blocks from Lorene, disappeared six weeks after Lorene and was never found. She and Lorene reportedly closely resembled each other, and in spite of the difference in their age, uh, was never... Oh, sorry. They looked very similar despite one being 10 years older than the other. It has never been shown that their disappearances were linked. Uh, Just kind of giving my own conspiracy theories for you here, I guess. While there is no evidence that the two cases are connected, it is also worth noting that Rachel Garden, another petite brunette about the same age as Laureen, disappeared from a nearby town just one month before Laureen did. She was also never found. So this really does sound like Taken, like where they were auctioning them off. Right. And this and is just like we're in New Hampshire. It was, it was the summer of short brunettes. Yeah. Like that's what was in. Yeah. So it says Rachel's case also remains unsolved as well and is also classified as a non family abduction. Um so this is where I get to the part where hopefully maybe if anybody listening has any type of information concerning this case, please contact the Manchester Police Department. Phone number is Area code 603-668-8771. Um, you know, that's wishful thinking for sure. We're talking about a 37-year-old cold case, but... Uh, Fucking flooded with prank phone calls, oh, though. Please don't. If you do, don't attribute them to us, at least. Like, you know, I know they say any publicity is good publicity, but I don't know that I can handle that shit. <laughs> that's too much for my plate. I don't want to go on Good Morning America about how we're fucking with the cold case line at the Manchester Police Department. <laughs> So please only call with relevant facts to the Manchester Police Department. I'll, I'll go. It's fine. Yeah, Greg will go. Sure. I'm itching to get some national TV coverage. So I have one more kind of uh, this one. I think you're gonna like a lot. It kind of touches on our. Um, I do like this one a lot. Yeah, and I think had you read it before because it's an old post. Um, yeah, I. Well, I I've seen the references, and so I looked it up, and I saw it. I wasn't. <clears throat> Excuse me, I wasn't there for it when it happened. But. Right, I stumbled onto. Okay, so this is a Reddit post, you guys. I I didn't f- find it by going to our ghosts. I think I just went onto a post that was like, "What's a crazy found footage thing that you you know blah blah blah." So it like led me to a comment, which led me to a post, which led me to another comment, which led me to a post. So eventually, I get here. Um, so this is down a, the Reddit hole. Exactly, got down the Reddit hole. And uh, it was it was on our ghosts, but um, a lot of people in the comments and myself included happens to think it's something slightly more sinister. Um, it's a three year old post, and I, uh, I I think I actually started in a true crime sub, so that's where it went from. Um, let me explain before it sounds too kooky to you guys listening out there. Reddit user Red Wants Blue eighty posted a long post about how they use a sleep app. A lot of us use this; it's like a sleep tracker. It kind of records. The noises you make at night, you know, you turning over in bed and kind of records the uh, the amount of sleep you're getting, the, the quality, of, the the quality sleep. of sleep you're getting. Yeah, exactly. So um, Red Wands Blue uses this app and um, one day they're cleaning up the sleep tracking app and they noticed um, that one night has like a really big spike in action. So they listen in on that spike, and it seems to be someone having a conversation in the room that they are in. So I have audio. There's an original audio, and then there's a cleaned up audio. So I'm going to play both for you. 
Um, this is going to be the original audio. Um, to me, it sounds like she wakes up to somebody in her bedroom, but not really. You know, you've probably done it before where you woke up and said, like, what are you doing? And the person's like, nothing. You know, like, yeah, cool. And you just kind of go back to sleep. That's what it sounds like to me. Um, again, this is in our ghosts. So this person initially believed that they had caught some type of um, ghost on, on audio. So let me just run it for you. We'll play a cleaned up version after this. But let's, you know, let's see if you guys hear anything that maybe uh, Greg or myself is missing. So did you get any of that? It sounded like, what are you doing? Nothing. Right. And, and then like. And then I'm done at the end. Right. Like it just sounded like someone like trying to get someone to go back to sleep to me. This is the cleaned up version. Um, I, I don't know. It sounds creepy. I, I, I have definitely had moments where I woke up and asked a question or told somebody like, get the fuck out of here or whatever it was. Yeah. And them telling me about it the next day and me being like, what? I didn't fucking say that or, you know, whatever the situation was. So, you know, to me, it sounds like somebody comes in and they're like maybe opening a drawer, opening a bag. You kind of hear some clicking. And then that sounds like um, it sounds like hands like, you know, like when you stand there and kind of nervously swing your hands back and forth in front of you and like hit your pants together. Oh, okay. Cause it's like someone you know what I'm like talking about? fidgeting essentially. Yeah. You know what yeah. I'm talking about? Like where you clap in front and kind of yeah, clap behind yeah, you. Yeah. So he's kind like of a little kid. Okay. So, and then it sounds like maybe the woman sits up and says, what are you doing? Like clearly probably not recognizing somebody here uh, in a lucid state. And the person says like nothing or, you know, I'm not nothing. I'm not up to nothing. And, no more yeah, it, and then you kind of hear like she makes like weird. another sound or like something unintelligible and then it's like yeah i'm done and then the, the clip ends it's a 21 second clip yeah so let's run that let's run that uh, cleaned up one really quick here yeah I don't know why it just gives me goosebumps. Like that, that cleaned up one is even more confusing because there's stuff going on in the background. Right, and... like maybe there's two people in there, like someone's yeah. still kind of getting business done while he's. I'm just trying to think of Jesus the, Christ, the rhythm me. of the pops there. Like I'm trying to figure out what would be in that rhythm because that's it's pretty irregular. You know what I mean? Like I saw, so I saw in like the things they're talking. Oh, it's the fan popping. Because it was like one of those plastic oscillating fans. Do you want to hear it one more time? Please. Original or cleaned up? Uh, both if we have time. Yeah, we got time. Okay, so let's go Let's go cleaned up version one more time here. Okay. We can break this down. We got time. We, we, let's sit here and talk about what we think this is. Okay. You know what it sounds like to me? What? The 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 clicks at least. I'll sh I'll yeah. show you right now. A little it sounds like the water bottle. Yeah, it sounds like a clicking like someone has a plastic water bottle like maybe they walked in with for whatever reason a plastic water bottle and that's what they're nervously fumbling with. Um or um it sounds like some popping knuckles. Maybe that's kind of a nervous thing you might do too. This way. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's run. Let's run the non clean up. It sounds like maybe there's a ceiling fan or a box fan running. That's why they clean it up. So here's the. Well, I think she said it was an oscillating. An okay. Oscillating like 
desk fan, but so let's, before, you, before you play it back again, yeah, a, it sounded like the TV was on in the background. I think that was something specifically that was stated. Absolutely not. There was no TV on. Okay, then what's with like theme music in the background? Is is that happening? Let's, yeah, let's, let's, listen let's to the, listen all to right. the high pitched stuff going on in the background. There's totally theme music from something happening. What are you doing? Okay. Or maybe not. Maybe I'm tripping. There's not theme music. Maybe it just sounds. It's, it's room and it sounds like talking or something. Huh. Let's Don't run worry it. about me. No, no. I, 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 I want to hear everything you've got. Let's run it back one more time here. Definitely no theme music. I'm tripping on that, but it sounds like talking right before she says, "What are you doing?" Yeah, it's it's um. Sorry, I'm not trying to run again there. It's um. I don't know. I I listen to it. Sounds, it. it sounds like there's small voices off in the distance. I don't know. Like the uh, TV's on in the next room or something. What if maybe uh, it was somebody breaking into her house, but it's someone she knew. That's why she sat up and, "What are you doing?" And you know, he's like, oh, "Don't worry about it." You know, like. Somebody that could reassure her. So if it, if, she, if in fact she did wake up in such a state, I don't know. It's 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 all bizarre to me. Uh, the Reddit poster says that they don't live in the house anymore because once people started positing the uh, burglary theory, uh, I think it really freaked them out a lot more than the possibility of a ghost. So um, yeah, there's there is no more uh, living in well, that she, in that place. The- she had a, a daughter there too. At the correct. Time, I think. Correct. Correct. So but it's definitely it, it, a male voice. That second voice, right? Uh, in the cleaned up version, not so much. Okay. Well, I mean, who but knows? It, it's it's definitely very. Uh, it's 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 deeper than what a what a fucking five year old or four year old or whatever it was. Right. It's definitely deeper than that, but it's it's like two sleepwalking people talking to each other, possibly. Yeah. Yeah, like I one mean, in a she, dreamlike state and the other sleepwalking in. Yeah, she was talking about how um, she was like, I know what my kid made, what, what kind of sounds my kid can make, and I know what kind of sounds I can make, and I know that wasn't me talking to myself. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I, 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 I'm, that's real. Like, if you know that you can't make that noise. Right. Very, very then, bizarre. But yeah, also, and I, and I, I mean. Noises, uh, I'm always making hilarious noises. But also, you know, and again, not to hearken too much back to anxious extroverts, but we know because of sleep, the sleepwalking episode that, um, you know, people murder, you know, you, you say oh, I could never make that noise, but people kill people, drive across town and kill people in their sleep. So, um, you know, true. saying you couldn't and actually not being able to is two different things, in my opinion. Um, yeah. Well, that's that's pretty much where we'll wrap it up. To, where, that's where we'll wrap it up today. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, let let us know seriously if you guys if you guys liked kind of I guess the format of tonight. Again, uh, the game show is always the goal, and we're still shooting for that weekly. Um, unfortunately, you know, like Greg said, a lot of work goes into coordinating people being here, putting together the outline, putting together the show. So we are going to continue to do what we can, but we still are going to get you guys weekly episodes, whether they're Greg and I uh, with a collection of stories, whether it's we, we do dive into a serial killer together. Um, you guys will still get an episode every Friday, so we, we can promise you that. Um, tons of ways to reach out to us if you want. Facebook is just as we are, Serial Chillers Podcast. Instagram is the same, Serial Chillers Podcast. Uh, the Twitter is at Chillers Podcast email. Serial Chillers Podcast at gmail.com. We have the voicemail line that I do take off occasionally. So you might call and I might answer. I don't know. That phone number 1 805 666 2513. Patreon, we, you know, we mentioned at the top. I won't get too deep into it. Um, just thanks again to Michelle and Laura for donating this month. Um, it's, it's as little as a dollar a month. It just it helps us. I mean, there's so many tiny costs that I had no idea would ever come up ever in podcasting that 
that just keep going. Uh, I'm not asking for money for nothing. You know, we, we, we come out here, we work hard, we want to get this show to you guys. Like I said, every week it's going to be out here for you. So if you guys like what we're doing, as little as a dollar a month, patreon.com slash Serial Chillers Podcast. Um, thanks to everyone who has, and thanks to everyone who will. Uh, we'll be back later this week, Friday. Uh, I've got it set up. We're going to have a game show episode and can't wait to bring it. Um, anything on the way out, Greg? Uh, nothing that's appropriate for radio. Perfect. Well, we're not on radio, just to clear that up. Uh, I've been told not to talk about stuff like that anymore. All right. So Greg's going to plead the fifth. And I will thank everybody for listening to episode 23 of the Serial Chillers podcast. Remember, don't talk to strangers. Goodbye, everybody.